In this video, I'm gonna turn these broken speakers into high quality studio monitors. Keep watching to see how I do this. Hey guys, what's up? It's been quite some time since I've posted a video. This is because I've been quite busy with a couple of projects. One of them being an album that I'm gonna release. So definitely stay tuned for that. And another project was this one. So last year I was looking for full range midfield monitors to add to my studio. I was hoping to find something reasonably priced, so I also had a look at some vintage hi-fi speakers, as I had heard some that were pretty good at a friend's house. I did not immediately find something that really sounded the way I like it though. At the same time I was also getting inspired by a couple of videos that James and Mark at Present Day Production did, where they modified existing speakers and even ended up designing their own speakers. I found this quite interesting and I wanted to learn more about speakers and how they're made. So I thought I could perhaps also try to find some bargain second-hand speakers and try to mess around with them to make them sound better. Just a little disclaimer, this is the first time I've ever even opened up a speaker. So even though I did a lot of research, I definitely might have made mistakes. If I did or could have done things in a better way, definitely let me know in the comments. So about half a year ago, I picked up a pair of these CS515 Vintage Pioneer speakers for next to nothing. They're three-way hi-fi speakers from the mid-70s. The three-way design exists out of a 250mm carbon fiber base driver, a 120mm paper mid-range driver and a 25mm titanium dome tweeter. These three drivers together give us, according to the original spec, a frequency response from 35Hz to 20,000Hz. So that should be most of the audible range in the human hearing. The drivers cross over at 700Hz and 5000Hz. This is also a front-ported design and the sensitivity of the speaker is 90 dB at 8 ohms. You might have noticed that there's a little hole in the dust cap of the bass driver. This is something you don't see a lot. The hole is there because they are front-vented. This allows the voice coil inside of the driver to cool down. Most drivers are vented from the back, so you don't see a hole in that case. By the way, this is not just a hole where dust and debris can enter into the driver. There's a little mesh inside of the hole to stop that. The MSRP per speaker for these was originally 363 Deutsche Mark, which adjusted for inflation is comparable to about 519 euros and 26 cents today. But you can usually find them a lot cheaper second hand now, that is if you can find them. Just like me, these bad boys were made in Belgium, and just like me, they also have seen better days. After trying them out for the first time, I quickly noticed the high frequencies were rather silent. I could turn up the high frequencies on my amp a little bit, and this made the sound more balanced, but I also heard a very papery high frequency sound then. It was almost like the high frequencies were being reproduced by the mid-range driver. After closer inspection, I noticed that the high frequencies were indeed coming from the mid-range driver and there was no sound coming from the tweeters. Since I was going to mess around with these speakers anyway, I didn't care too much that something was broken and I started looking how I could fix the issue. I took the tweeters out of the speakers to see what was going on and I noticed that there was a lot of corrosion on the back of the tweeter. It looked like the material on the sticker had somehow corroded with the material of the magnet. I suppose this was most likely caused by moisture, but I'm not a chemist, so it could be something else as well. I cleaned up some of the corrosion and hooked the tweeter up to a multimeter. On the display I could see that there was unlimited resistance. This made me think that the voice call might have been broken. After that, I decided to open up the tweeter to see what's going on. When removing the voice coil from the magnet, a lot of dirty nastiness flew around. I could immediately see that some of the corroded material had gotten inside of the magnet as well. The voice coil itself was not broken, but it still had unlimited resistance, so perhaps it burned out or something. I talked to Mark from present day production and he told me there's probably no way I could repair these tweeters because the magnets were corroded. Since I could also find no information about this tweeter, the best thing I could probably do was to replace them with the cheapest tweeter I could find. That is, if the other drivers still sounded okay. The rest of the drivers didn't sound too bad to me, so I decided to buy two new tweeters and try to adapt the internal crossover network if that's necessary. The crossover network is the electronics inside of a passive speaker that send the signals to the appropriate driver. So for example, the high frequencies to the tweeter and the low frequencies to the bass woofer. Finding a replacement tweeter was no easy feat though. The original tweeters had a diameter of 120mm and that is a lot larger than most tweeters. So I had to make sure the new tweeter could fit inside the hole of the enclosure. You also cannot just put in any tweeter as a replacement. You have to make sure that the combination of the sensitivity of the driver and its electrical impedance closely matches that of the rest of the system because else you might get a tweeter that is either way too loud or way too silent. After a lot of researching and looking around, I ended up purchasing two of these planar tweeters. They're not the cheapest tweeters around, but they have the right size, pretty nice specs as well, and a pretty linear frequency response. A couple of weeks later they arrived at my door, 
and I started installing them. The back of the tweezers did not fit 100% so I had to make some very small cutouts to make them fit inside of the enclosure. I then drilled some new holes in the enclosure and started screwing in the tweezers. And then the speakers ended up looking like this. Now sound was coming from the tweeters again and the speaker already sounded nice enough to for example put them in your living room. But they were definitely not at a point yet where I would put them in a studio. There were still some changes needed in the crossover to make them sound better. With the entire spectrum now playing again, I also noticed hearing some other issues. For example, I heard some resonances coming from the cabinet. Even though these resonances can be considered as pleasant to listen to and give a little more body to the music, they're not part of the original signal, so they're kind of coloring the sound. And in a studio monitor, that's not something we want. When I hit the cabinet, you can also hear ringing. These speakers were obviously made to hit a certain price point and I think Pioneer cheaped out a little on the cabinets to hit that price point. When music was playing I could also hear some resonances coming from the port itself. Another issue I found when opening up the speaker, which is not really related to the sound quality, is the use of fiberglass as a dampening material inside of the speaker. Since this is a ported design, this is a real health hazard. When playing the speaker, fiberglass particles are going to spew out of the port, enter into the room and end up in your lungs. So the first thing I did was remove the fiberglass from the cabinets and make sure that there are no particles left. With the fiberglass now removed, we can also have a look inside of the cabinet. We can see that there's not a lot of bracing in the cabinets, and this is one of the reasons that the cabinet is resonating. We can also take a closer look at the crossover network right now, which seems pretty simple. One eternity later. At this point, I had done a ton of research, and I really had two options to proceed. I'd just order a couple of parts for the crossover and hope for the best, but in that case, it would probably be very hard for me to get them to sound exactly the way I like it. The other option was to continue with the plan of turning these into studio monitors, but there the approach would be totally different and would also require a lot more materials and money. I really contemplated whether trying to make these into studio monitors would be worth it and I also wondered if I could actually do it. After all, I'm a music producer, I'm not a professional acoustician or speaker designer. Thinking it could be a great learning opportunity, I ended up biting the bullet and started ordering parts that I needed for this project. Two thousand years later. After I received most of the required parts, I started with removing the crossover network. As my electronics knowledge is pretty limited and I'm more of a computer wizard, I wanted to do the crossovers digitally using DSP. DSP stands for Digital Signal Processing and it's a way to improve or alter sound digitally. You can do things like balance the sound, correct the sound quality or even add effects. This allows a lot more flexibility than a passive crossover and you can really fine tune the sound to your liking. I wanted to run the amplifiers and the DSP externally. So I made some holes in the back of the speaker, so I could add an nl connector later. Running the amps externally makes it a lot easier to program the DSP, and it also has some other benefits, but more about that later. To make the cabinet resonances disappear, I had to make the cabinet as inert as possible. I started with adding a brace in the back of the speaker. I cut a piece of wood just large enough to friction fit inside of the enclosure. Then I also used glue to make sure that it wouldn't budge anymore. I noticed this improved the ringing of the cabinets a little, So I also added braces on the other surfaces of the enclosures. It looks like we also have a visitor. A little spider thought it would be a cozy home to live in. Here you can see the result after I was finished. Another way to stop the resonances of the speaker is by adding mass to the cabinet. For this I used bitumen sheets. Bitumen is some kind of asphalt that is often used in roofing and it's very heavy. It's not an easy material to work with though. I tried different ways of cutting and sawing the sheets I ordered, but none really worked great. In the end, the easiest way to cut it into pieces was to first cut a line in it with a box cutter and after that fold the material on the cut after which it would tear apart. The sheets also have an adhesive backing, so I could just stick them to the interior walls of the cabinet. 
I had to repeat this for all the interior walls and that was quite a tedious process. But it's totally worth it, because even when a speaker is not fully done yet, I could already hear a big difference with the original box. It took 3 days in total to apply the bitumen sheets everywhere. I also added some bitumen around the port, as it seemed to be made from some type of cardboard material, and I wanted to make sure that the material was not resonating as well. Since I had removed the fiberglass material, I also needed a replacement for that. A dampening material is needed to further dampen any cabinet resonances, but also any standing waves inside of the cabinet. I looked at a lot of options and I ended up using woven felt sheets. I chose felt for its excellent acoustic properties. Luckily, these sheets were a lot easier to cut. I could just cut through the adhesive layer on the back of the sheets with a box cutter and then complete the cut with scissors. Then I just needed to remove the paper from the adhesive layer and apply it on the inside walls. Here you can see the result after I was finished. After that it became time to inhale some toxic lead fumes. I soldered the speaker wires to the NLA connectors and attached those to the cabinet by screwing them on. I then also took the male and late connectors and attached those to a 6 wire Mojami cable. The 6 wires would allow me to send a different signal to every driver in the speaker. This seemed a lot safer and easier to me than running 6 different wires from the amplifier to the speaker. You can just put in one connector and lock it in place. Once this was done, it was time to work on the amplifier. I used two power supplies, one for each speaker. I chose this specific power supply for the low EMI and output ripple. This was important because I paired them with two Wondum Jab 5 boards, which are Class D amplifier boards with built-in DSP. Class D amps are notorious for being susceptible to noise issues, and I wanted to avoid noise as much as possible while still keeping the budget of this project in check. These Jab 5 boards are pretty cost-effective boards that can amplify up to four speakers independently. You can also combine the output of two outputs into one, and that gives you the double amount of wattage. I wired up the boards in a triamp mode so that they would deliver 100 watts to the tweeter, 100 watts to the mid-range driver and 200 watts to the bass woofer. This is the power at 6 ohms by the way. It wasn't super easy to wire everything up. I was really afraid that I was going to mess up at some point and either destroy a driver or some components, so I really needed to double check everything. Even though it looks like a rat's nest at this point, I succeeded in wiring up everything properly. Another benefit of these boards is that they also accept Bluetooth Aptix HD as an input. This can be a handy way to let people connect to the speakers if they come into the studio. Even though it's a lossy stream, it's almost indistinguishable from using a cable. I also connected the two boards together so they use the same input signal. This allows us to easily use one Bluetooth signal for both speakers. The Jab 5 boards have a Sigma DSP chip on them. Using a software called Sigma Studio, we can really fine tune how the sound is processed and sent to every amplifier in the system. In Sigma Studio, we can also do the crossover digitally, so no messing around with a whole bunch of electronic components. I measured the drivers using white noise and frequency sweeps to see what their limits are and how they perform. After that I decided to use different crossover points than the original speaker. Since the tweeter and midrange are pretty far apart, I tried to lower the crossover point as much as possible without it causing any issues to the sound. I ended up crossing it over at 3500Hz instead of 5000Hz. If I understood it correctly, lowering the crossover point should help to avoid phase issues when moving in the vertical axis or when moving closer and further away from the speaker. The mid-range driver could also perform a lot lower than the 700Hz it was originally crossed over at, and with a lot more precision than the bass driver, so I also lowered the crossover point between the bass driver and the mid-range driver to 300Hz. Another upside of using DSP is that I can correct the output of a driver using an EQ. An EQ or equalizer is a filter that helps to adjust the loudness of certain frequencies. For example, the mid-range driver has a bit of a skewed frequency response. It's a bit hotter on the higher frequencies than on the lower frequencies. Using a DSP we can correct this and then the driver output becomes ruler flat. I also used EQ to fix some bumps and dips in the frequency response caused by edge diffraction, which is a little bit of a problem with the front baffle of this speaker. In the end I can also use DSP to tune the speakers exactly right for the room they are in and to my liking it's pretty handy that i can do this directly on the amplifier and it eliminates the need for software like sonarworks it's a bit more work though after a day or two of repeatedly measuring the speakers and correcting the crossover points and filters i ended up with the first version of the signal processing chain that was ready so how does it sound well actually i'm pretty impressed with the results i've gotten so far
speakers sound well balanced, very detailed, especially in the higher frequencies and mid frequencies. And the sound stage is huge. The resonances are also not noticeable anymore. The planar tweeter sounds amazing. I did apply a subtle high shell filter to it because it sounded a little too airy to my taste. But after that, it sounded really detailed and accurate. The mid-range driver is still quite capable for its age. It's also remarkably detailed for a speaker of that era at that price point. At one point I was listening to a song by Eminem that I've heard hundreds of times before and I noticed a little distortion on the right channel. First I thought I might have overextended one of the drivers in the system but after listening to the song on another system I heard that the sound was actually in the recording. However on other speakers I had never really noticed it before but on these speakers it just smacked me in the face. And that's exactly what you want with a studio monitor. It should reveal problems in a mix to you. The bass driver doesn't sound bad, but its low end extension could be a little bit better. The driver gradually rolls off under 70 Hz, and under 40 Hz, the output is not very high. This is something that can potentially be improved in the DSP or by moving the speaker closer to the wall. But the bass woofer certainly has its limitations and it's hard to work around that if I don't want to overextend the driver or harm the fidelity of the sound. One downside is that despite my efforts to minimize noise, the amplifiers still produce a bit of noise. While it's not very noticeable at a distance and the speaker should be used at a distance anyway, it is noticeable when you get up close to the speaker. That being said, it is miles better than what you get with, for example, a KRK Rocket 10 3G4. But all in all, I'm very happy with the results. At this point, they can definitely be used to produce and mix on. And I think they can even compete with some studio monitors that are considered high-end. This is quite remarkable, considering how much I've only spent on the project. I wish I could let everyone hear how they sound, but sadly, using YouTube, it's not easy to do that accurately. So what's next? Well... I'm planning to further tweak the filters in the DSP to make the speakers even sound better. There might also be some possibilities to improve the time alignment of the drivers. I'll also look if I can somehow improve the noise output coming from the amplifiers. If anyone has a good idea for that, definitely let me know in the comments. I also need to clean up this mess. I'm planning to create an enclosure for the amplifiers so everything is nice and tidy. And I'm not sure yet, but I might also experiment with switching to another bass driver. Modern bass drivers are sometimes capable of better low-end extension and also more accuracy. This will result in a more tighter sound. If you want to see a follow-up video to this, definitely hit that subscribe button. If this video inspired you and you want to try this yourself, I definitely advise to do some research first. Some speaker designs are better than others, and if you start with a design that is flawed to begin with, there will be only so much you can do to improve it. While this speaker did have its flaws, I could correct quite a few of them, and that's not possible with all flaws. For example, if your speaker has some kind of weird type of driver arrangement, it might be much harder to make them sound good. That being said, I also think recycling or upcycling speakers can be very rewarding, and it's also a lot better than just throwing them in the trash. Alright guys, it took a lot of effort to make this video, so I hope you will give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Also, a big shout out to Mark and James from Present Day Production for their advice during this project. Definitely go give their channel a visit if you're into music production. If you have any questions, suggestions or tips, definitely leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching 